Welcome to Media and Monuments Podcast, presented by Women in Film and Video in Washington, D.C. Media and Monuments is conversations featuring industry pros speaking on a wide range of topics of interest to media makers. Thank you for joining us on Media and Monuments. I'm Sandra Abrams, your host for this episode. In this episode, we'll shed light on the critical role of film commissioners in the DC, Maryland, and Virginia film offices. These offices serve as a resource for media makers seeking to get projects done. They help with permits, finding locations, and offer tax credits. Directors of these offices also strive to promote their region as part of a state's economic strategy by providing opportunities for businesses, jobs, and tourism. I'll chat with Andy Edmonds from the Virginia Film Office, Angie Gates, the director of DC's office, and Jack Gerbis, who heads up Maryland's film office. Andy Edmonds is the director of the Virginia Film Office and vice president of Virginia Tourism. Andy is a Virginia native. In fact, he studied music at VCU and then went on to produce a music video of one of his songs that was broadcast on MTV. That was a pivotal experience for him because it introduced him to the film industry. Then in 1997, he joined the Virginia Film Office. Andy has worked with many notable filmmakers over the years, including Terrence Malick, Ridley Scott, and Steven Spielberg. Welcome, Andy, to Media and Monuments. Thank you, Sandra, so much for having me. Well, one of the things I realized in looking at your bio, you wear a lot of hats. So you're the director of the film office and you're vice president of tourism. What's the most important role that people don't know that you have in this capacity? Well, as a film commission, we're the liaison between production world that runs at 187 miles an hour, as you know, and government world that runs, let's say, a little bit slower sometimes, right? So we, yes. <laughs> at our office, we, we, we're we all production people. So we, we know the needs of producers and they can be intense needs and a long list of needs because making a movie is pretty much like disaster management sometimes, right? So there are many problems that need to be solved. So my kids used to ask me, you know, what do you do for a living? And I say, well, I turn no into yes, because it's really very easy for for example, a government official to say no if you have some unusual request, let's say if you want to land a helicopter on a highway or on a building or you need to set a building on fire for a movie, it's easy for someone to say no because then they go on about their day. Now, our role is to express to them what an advantage it is to have this production work and the economic opportunity it brings to a community Uh to justify these unusual things we may have to do from time to time that are for the good of the many. Our role at the film office is to be the liaison, not only between government and production, between communities and production, between location owners. So we're peacemakers, we're psychologists, we're babysitters, we're private investigators. It really is a, a long list of things we do, which makes it so exciting and so so much why I love what I do at the film office. We we like to say we're in the in the we're all about filmmaking for the art and for the business. We understand both sides of the coin, and helping filmmakers execute the vision they're seeking within the budget they have is what we're here to help them do. And whether it's a big massive production. Or I like to say whether it's Steven Spielberg or Steven Johnson, you know, we, we help them all with whatever whatever they need to do. And and really for our industry here in Virginia, I I like to help smaller movies with great enthusiasm because often they need the most help, right? And I would rather do five small movies than one big movie. One of the reasons is that with a smaller movie, a lot of the local crew has an opportunity to work up at a higher level of the food chain. Then on a big movie, they might bring in all of their key positions. So it's a, great to have a mix of, of bigger scale production with smaller independent film to create kind of a healthy community of, of the whole production palette, if you will, the whole production pie. For it. So everyone gets to jump in and have that dessert. So it sounds like there's no typical day of the week or typical project that you're doing. It's just uh, a lot of different things that can happen seven days a week. It's an avalanche of problem solving. 
<laughs> That's what production is, you know? And it's in this business, because we're in marketing and sales on one side, and we're in problem solving and disaster management on the other side, you have to live in a world and bifurcate your brain into two mindsets of optimism and pessimism. You have to be really prepared for anything that could go wrong at any time. You know, is that person going to show up with a leaf blower on set that's going to mess up the production while they're trying to film? At the same time, you want to be optimistic in your your presentation to your clients in, in a very optimistic way because you want them to feel positive about the opportunity. But at the same time, you don't want to sugarcoat it for clients. I never tell them what they want to hear, you know, and I think that's what's given us a reputation of, of developing trust. You have to develop trust with your clients trust with your crew, trust with the communities. It's trust is so important in whatever business you're in and the relationships you develop over the years is what really leads to your next job, whether you're a cast member, a crew member, a screenwriter. It's about those relationships you develop. And I, I tell you, Sandra, I could draw a thread from projects today that have most recently happened you know, back 15 years to, to various, you know, relationships we've had that will lead to our next project. You know, they, they came, they had a great experience. You develop friendships and relationships, and then they're the ones that ring the phone when they have another opportunity that they think that we could support them with and help them with. And, and that's really what's most rewarding is that you are able to work at a business where you create lifelong friendships, you know. It's, I like to say making friends is a lot more important than making movies. Well, speaking of making movies, though, you have all these relationships and people keep coming back. Well, how do you find new business? You know, what is that process like for you when trying to find prospective people to come and film? Because now there's a lot of competition. Well, everybody, every state, municipality has a film office and they're bidding for new business. How, how, do, you, how do you find new business? Well, it's interesting because our our job at a film commission used to be about uh, logistics of helping them find how to get a permit to film, right? So it started out as this permit facilitation operation, and then it turned into a location service. So then every film commission was expected to provide this service, which was fine because we used to have just, you know, thousands and thousands of manila folders of taped together photographs that we would send out FedEx boxes to clients and so then we had to obviously create a digital database to do that. And we were actually in Virginia, one of the first states to scan in thousands of photos into a quote unquote digital database that was new at the time. Because when I started at the film office, I actually offered to work for free. I went to Rita McClenney, my boss still at, at Tourism, and offered to work for free to convert the all these manila folders of pictures into a digital format. And back then in like 1996, 97, Everyone was like, what's that? And I said, believe me, it's going digital. We have to scan this stuff in. And so we worked with Virginia Tech and we sent thousands of files up to Virginia Tech. They scanned them in. Wow. And we created this, this database, which was like groundbreaking at the time where you it, could it actually- It sounds actually, like it. Yeah. Back in, back then. Yeah. Yeah. It was, and you could actually search, you could type in with these keywords, you could type in, you know, red barn by a pond. And you could pull it up for the first time. And it was really uh, groundbreaking at the time. And we were the first state. To have and use this technology, the only other state that had it uh, was California. They had a system developed by NASA. So we were like right on the cutting edge of the technology. And uh, I say that just to say we, we've always tried to use technology as a tool to give us an advantage to, to get new business. We used to use uh, GIS mapping when we had Civil War projects looking for battlefields. That we would go down to economic development and get all this cool satellite photography so we could really look at the topography of, of land and find out where wharfs and docks were on waterfront and use this technology to give us a competitive advantage. But now what's happened, Sandra, as you know, is that you basically have to buy the jobs. You know, it's tax credits, it's grants, and it used to be about locations and having the best logistical donut to offer a client, having everything in a small geographical area to execute the work. And the, the, the crew, of course, is super important. But really now you have to have a robust incentive program to compete. So the notion of going out for new business 
is all predicated on the fact that you have enough of a war chest to attract that business. So I used to go out on calls to California probably two or three times a year to meet with friends and relationships and talk about what they had in the pipeline and things like that. But if you go on those calls today and they're like, well, how much, how many tax credits, how much do you have left in your tax credit pool? You go, well, we've kind of used it on this and that, and we really don't have, it, it's a very short conversation. So it's really frustrating. For example, you know, Georgia has $1.2 billion a year that they stroked out in tax credits last year. In Virginia, we have 10 million. So 10 million versus $1.2 billion. I mean, that is a really hard competitive reality. However, that being said, we're really efficient in how we use ours to try to target things that will create the maximum return on investment for Virginia. And we actually created unique relationships with some of our partners, first of which was AMC. We did a television series here called Turn about George Washington spies and how George Washington used espionage as a tool to win the revolution. Really fascinating series, right? Great show. Yes, I saw it. I saw it. <laughs> Great show. And they, they spent over four seasons, you know, north of $100 million here. And, and it required a significant incentive at the time. But we thought it would be a great investment for Virginia. And we made an arrangement with AMC and said, okay, well, we could provide this incentive, but we want to do something unique and have you produce at your expense, because you have cameras, you have all this stuff, you make a commercial for Virginia tourism to promote people to come and learn more about colonial history, come visit Virginia. And they said, well, we've never really done that. I'm like, well, if you want these incentives to be sustainable, we have to come up with unique ways and innovative ways to maximize the ROI for the state. And so they agreed to do it. And they ended up producing this uh, 15 second commercial that was broadcast nationwide on all the AMC channels, including Sundance Channel and their other properties. And it was over 200 plays. So that was like a big media buy that Virginia would have had to pay for. And in fact, the only national advertising Virginia had for Virginia tourism was through our relationship with film, right? So this added to the overall ROI equation to justify expanding our incentive program and in, in a technique and an innovative idea that no other state had done. Now, some of them have started to do that more, but we were the first ones to get an actual media buy as part of our deal. And then to take that to another level, another way that we kind of leverage it, Sandra, is with, you know, we had uh, Wonder Woman 1984. Interestingly, the way that came down was, you know, they needed a mall. They needed a mall that they could dress up as a 1980s era mall. And they had to come to Washington, D.C. for many of the other script elements. So we knew they were coming to Washington, D.C. So they really wanted to find a mall within striking distance of, of, of D.C. So we had, fortunately, the big landmark mall in Alexandria that had been empty for a while. And there were some other malls they were looking at in Philadelphia. I think there was one in Maryland. But they were trying to do the math, frankly, between building a mall on a soundstage in the UK, right? And how much would it cost them to do that versus using a mall in the United States while they're doing the DC work in, uh, in, in the United States. And so we, we knew that we had this mall and we showed it to them and they really liked it. And we were able to help them facilitate an arrangement with the owners of the mall. But they still, they wanted a significant incentive for coming to Virginia, which I can understand that because they think just the standard operating procedure was like, you know, we're going to spend $16 million. You need to give us $4 million, right? That's just what the expectation is. But obviously, when you have an annual pool that's only at the time was only about $9 million, we were like, you know, we can't give up $4 million, half of our pool just for one show that we'll film for this portion in Northern Virginia. So we came up with a much smaller figure to offer them less than a million, actually. And uh, we said, look, we can offer this this grant for the production because we want to support you in every way we can. We know the mall will be a great asset. But how about if you incorporate into the mall scene a way to promote Virginia tourism and let's put the Virginia's for Lovers brand and a welcome center in the mall or something like that with people with Virginia's for Lovers t-shirts and basically a product placement for Virginia tourism in this big global movie, right? And they said, okay, well, we might be able to work that out. So they agreed to do that. But then what happened is um, Patty Jenkins, the director, who's from Virginia, went to you know, school in Northern Virginia, very familiar with the Virginia's for Lovers brand. She made a suggestion. She knew we wanted to get some product placement in the movie in this welcome place that they would do. 
she came with the idea and they proposed it to me and they said, well, how about Patty had an idea? We're going to create this big six foot drum in the movie. And we we're thinking about putting the Virginia's for Lovers logo on the drum. And then Wonder Woman grabs the bad guy and throws the bad guy through the drum and busts the drum with the Virginia's for Lovers logo on it. Would that be OK? <laughs> I said, yeah, that'll be just fine. <laughs> Because I mean that I knew that would be a scene where they would not get cut from the movie, right? That's going to stay in the film. So we're like, okay. And then I pushed it to another level, and I said, well, look, that's great. But after you finish with the drum, can we have the drum? And they said, yeah, sure, whatever. You can keep the drum. So we kept the drum. They was in the movie, very much highlighted in the beginning of the film. Huge, greatest product placement in the history of the world for any tourism entity, right? And then we kept the drum, we put a new skin on it, and then we put it in a place in Alexandria where visitors could come by and Instagram in front of it with a picture of Wonder, Wo Wonder Woman next to it. So it just became this you know, social media thing we could exploit long after the film was gone. So that's the kind of thing we do to try to maximize the people's money to, to bring this work here, to maximize those dollars so we can not only do it for you know, treasuring the, the, the Commonwealth's treasure, but also to demonstrate to legislators that, look, we do things just beyond even getting the jobs, which is great. We do even more to maximize that ROI, hopefully justifying a larger pool in the future, because it really, it takes money to make money. We need some more fuel. There's so many opportunities that we could have right now that if we don't have the fuel in the tank, we won't be able to get them. One part of your job, I guess, is interacting with the House of Delegates Finance Committee. And then also you have to make sure you have these two different incentive funds. So can you talk about your interaction with uh, the House of Delegates, how that works, and then about these funds? At the film office, we have multiple constituencies. You know, we have the communities we serve. We have the crew and the cast we serve, all the vendors that support the industry. And we have the clients we want to bring in and the clients that are within the state. But then, of course, our other constituencies are our partners in government, including the legislature and the governor's office. And the fuel we need for incentives is driven by policymakers that decide the priorities of the state. So in our office, we're not uh, allowed to lobby, per se, because we're a state entity. So the lobbying on behalf of the industry happens through the Virginia Production Alliance. So we incorporate we encourage everyone to join this group that is really the, the lobbying entity. And of course, Women in Film and Video, of course, is a great uh, lobbying entity too that can help support this. And there are other groups that have an interest in making sure our industry can grow. Now, my interaction with the legislature and with the governor's office and all the policymakers is one of education. You know, I, I'm able to go on appointments with these legislators and tell them by, or show them, here are the facts, here's our experience, Here's where the competition is. Here's what's happened. You know, we had Walking Dead, uh, World Beyond show. They were provided this amount of incentive. It spent this much based on their, their CPA review that they paid for at the end of the show, the audit that they did. And this is what the return was. So I bring all that data, all that marketing challenge that we're faced with and go on meetings with the lobbyists sometimes as a point of reference for because we're at the front line. We're the, we're the ones that, that take the calls and deal with and know what the clients need and know what the benefit can be. It's not a business about Hollywood, right? This is a business about Holly Smith, I like to say. Holly Smith, single mom, working in hair and makeup as a crew member, making $85,000 a year as a crew member that does not want to leave her family to have to go work in Georgia or Pittsburgh or somewhere else. They want to continue the job that they love right here in Virginia. The other point, Sandra, when I tell my kids that when I was their age, we only had three television stations to choose from, you know, they look at me like I'm an alien. And when you think about it today, where there's an unlimited number of platforms, streaming services, cable channels, and all of this means that there is a global demand that is insatiable for content. And the creation of this content at the end of the day is a manufacturing process that employs hundreds of skilled workers that are in everything from hands-on carpentry, seamstresses, to technicians in the digital world, to writers, to artists, to painters, to actors, to everything in between. So it's an industry that we should really uh, aggressively pursue, I believe, because 
when you add that reality to the just the fact that Virginia is such a perfect palette for storytelling because of the diverse locations we have, because of the relatively small geographical area that you can get from mountains to beaches and everything in between, because of all the historical assets, because of the reality, Richmond in particular is the northernmost city with southern architecture and the southernmost city with northern architecture. In Richmond, you can do Boston or you could do New Orleans. There are very few cities that have that capability to do that. So that's why when filmmakers come to Virginia, they love it and they want to come back. The Virginia Film Office is ready to serve you and they will go above and beyond and do whatever they can. If you want to reach out and learn more, go to www.film.virginia.org. So thank you so much, Andy. We appreciate your time. This was great. Thank you so much. And thank you to Women in Film and Video for the great work you guys do. Great group of folks and keeping people connected. Thank you. Angie Gates is the director of DC's Office of Cable Television, Film, Music, and Entertainment. That's O-C-T-F-M-E. She's from Louisiana by way of Mississippi with a bachelor's and a master's degree from the University of New Orleans. Prior to joining the D.C. Film Office, she was with D.C. Mayor Mariel Bowser. She served as the director of inauguration. She was also the general manager of the Warner Theater and was the first African-American to hold that position. And she's also a member of the Recording Academy, also known as the Grammys. Welcome, Angie, to Media and Monuments. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Sandra. I am delighted to be here. I'm like, was that me you were talking about? <laughs> yes, it was. And speaking of the D.C. Film Office, I guess I wanted to start off with this question, since we are with the federal government. It's known for its acronyms. We have the CDC, the FBI, the HHS. What was D.C. thinking? Did, were they trying to outdo with the number of letters? We have the O, the C, the T, the F, the M, the E. As they say on Saturday Night Live, what's up with that? I know. It, it, I think we have almost every letter in the, the alphabet, and people tend to get fancy and have created a word around it. But we do a lot. And a shout out first to Mayor Muriel Bowser uh, under her leadership and administration and with the support of the council, our office merged. It was originally motion picture and television development that merged with the Office of Cable Television and the new, new office, Office of Cable Television, Film, Music and Entertainment was birthed in 2015. Now, D.C. is the home of GoGo. And so it was very important now that it's the official music that we put some city efforts and resources behind the music industry. And we are the first agency really to focus day to day on the music. And when you couple that with our film focus as well, they really go hand in hand along with the television. So, uh, yes, it's a mouthful, but we, you know, we our, our sandbox is, is plentiful here on our playground. <laughs> Well, one of the things, reasons I wanted to talk to you was because you're from Louisiana. How did that experience being from Louisiana help you with what you're doing now in your current position? You know, I, I, will, I will say this, I, and I tell people this often, my Southern roots, the dirt roads of Mississippi and the bayous of Louisiana really prepared me uh, for where I am today. I come from good stock a legacy of women, but I've been in entertainment before I was born. My dad was a jazz musician. So when my mom, you know, was pregnant with me, I would be at uh, the gigs before I even made it to this, this world. So I was destined for, for entertainment. But I studied at the University of New Orleans. Undergrad is in arts administration. I did a specialty in film and communication. And then my master's is uh, in arts administration as well with a special concentration in sports management. And so in undergrad, I did my first silent film, but my internship was at the film office in New Orleans. So years ago, there was a discussion about tax credits and tax incentives. I had no idea at that time that I would be doing what I'm doing today. And life comes full circle. So I 
did an internship, worked on Interview with the Vampire with Ann Rice, Blue Chips uh, with Shaquille O'Neal. But what was interesting, being the film specialist, we worked on the Pelican Brief with John Gresham. When I came to D.C., I walked in the Warner building and I was like, this looks so familiar. This looks very familiar. And I had an epiphany. One of the scenes in the Pelican Brief, the law scene, was actually shot at the Warner Theater here in Washington, D.C. Wow. So years, my very first film gig to transition from being the film specialist in New Orleans to the film commissioner here in Washington, D.C., confirmed I was on the right path. And it's so exciting. Well, one of the things I noticed in looking through as to what happens with the D.C. film office, you also create shows. Mm -hmm. So which is something different that you don't see with other film offices. So can you just talk a little bit more about that um, particular situation? Absolutely. Can I start by saying we are a Emmy Award producing <laughs> team Yay! here at LCTF and me. Great, 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 great 202, I think yes, it was. we brought home the <laughs> first Emmy to the district uh, government with an interview, Belle Viv DeVoe. You know, the one thing with us, it's not that we were trying to obtain an Emmy. We just wanted to do good work. That was the main thing. We just wanted to do good work. And so we had the freedom and the flexibility to really showcase our talents internally, but then to also showcase the talents of the creatives of Washington, D.C. So we have three television networks. We have DCN, which is one of our longstanding networks, the District of Columbia Network. We have DCC, which is our city council, traditional policy and legislative channel. We have DKN, which is the District Knowledge Network. And that is our education component. And we utilize all of those networks, especially during our time of being virtual. But we wanted some of the best creative content to be on these networks. And so we started producing and we started working with the creatives and we touch on everything from a creative perspective. And we make sure that we remain inclusive and equitable, as well as highlight what the government has to offer. Now, we did something historic. We launched DC Radio. So we also have a full power radio station, the second full power station in the country ran by a municipality. That was historic. We made another historic move recently by launching DCE, which is the District of Columbia Entertainment Network. So those are all platforms that we've utilized our visual components, our video components, our audio components to really push the dial forward to have some really wonderful creative content here in Washington, D.C. Do you ever sleep? You know what? Actually, <laughs> like I, think so much I, on. I think I'm half unicorn, honestly. <laughs> I, I I have what I call uh, never ending days. I'll do cat naps in, in between. And it's it's wonderful because not one day has ever been the same in my in my career. So I love what I do. I'm passionate about it. I, I work with such a wonderful group of individuals that I really consider family. So it doesn't feel like work when we're here. And that's very rare. One of the things that we did during the time when we were going through this, you know, pandemic posture, we never really started to focus a lot on mental health. And that's something that we did differently. So normally it's the radio, television, film, things of that nature, but we developed something here for the creatives. And that's when we started a partnership with the George Washington University, where you get practically pay what you can. And if that's a penny, you get mental health counseling services. And that's something that you would never imagine that would happen in our office. Another thing that we learned during the pandemic is as creatives, you always focus on your brand, social media, your brand, your logos, but your business would be key, especially to get funding. So we started business over brand. And that is another uh, initiative that we did separate and apart, just really to make sure our entrepreneurs and creatives have solid footing in the business industry. And of course, we uh, celebrate with 202 Creates all month long. So I wanted to highlight that because that's that's important. You know, your creative being is, is key, but your physical and mental being is so important. So we don't ever want to overlook that. If somebody is new to the film business and is listening to this, how do they connect with your office? Like, what is it that they need to do? They go, oh, you're doing shows. 
well, I'm just starting to write something and I'm new to this. You know, what is it that you recommend? So we always like to take what is a concept and make it a reality. We are here to help walk through ideas and put action behind them. You can always contact our office directly. You can reach us at 202 671-0066. I'll repeat 202-671-0066. Visit our website, entertainment.dc.gov, or you can email our film division in particularly at film at dc.gov. There is no level of production that we are not happy to assist with. We have, of course, our permits division. We have resources when people like your your company and podcast, The Media Monuments. D.C. is so much more than the traditional monuments. We have very iconic landscapes here throughout all eight wards of Washington, D.C. So we have like D.C. Real Scout, where we can help you find locations, D.C. Real Crew, D.C. Real Vendors, where we help promote our various uh, vendors and businesses and help you get your business started. So people should just reach out to us directly. And we have funding. You know, we have the film rebate fund, which is cash back. But we also have sponsorships and partnerships where we're happy to help, you know, facilitate what you may need financially or may provide some income services. So I did want to speak about the monuments. We do have a lot of iconic monuments here. So it seems like to me that it would be an easy sell, but maybe because I'm a you know, from D.C. that I think everybody would want to come here and film. But what's the reality when you have big pictures? So, for example, Wonder Woman 1984 came and they wanted to film when you have these big budget pictures and they say we want to close down the street and we want to make sure that we're including this iconic building. What's the reality that's going on? The reality of uh, you can't show up in one day and it's all done in one day. We believe in communication. D.C. is open for business. We've been open for business. You can get some wonderful shots. We are a multi-jurisdiction city. So, yes, you can have one foot on the street in that city property and one foot on the sidewalk in that federal property. But we all collectively work together. We don't wait until a project comes to the forefront. We have longstanding relationships with various federal agencies. There's also the Mayor's Event Task Force that we work with. We don't believe in sending people to all the different agencies, whether it's city or federal agencies. We pride ourselves on being a one-stop shop. So we often love the fact when people start here first, and that way we can serve as a liaison on the federal side and on the city side. Wonder Woman was the largest and most economically impacting projects we've had here in Washington, D.C. since we've uh, started doing films. And talk about some good marketing and branding. <laughs> that spoke volume, but, but a lot of these crew uh, members and companies talk to each other. It all starts with customer service. Like, yes, L.A. is on a different time zone, but we're available like no matter what time. And we don't stop working at five o'clock. So, you know, we're not a nine to five type of operations. Entertainment is year long, weekends, nights, you know, and we're just we're available. So we make sure that we can make things happen. We have some projects that are here, you know, currently in student films. So across the board, we're here. We're here to serve. Do you have any particular, we just talked about Wonder Woman. Is there any other particular film or uh, media project that was going on where you have a special fond memory that you could share with us? For us, what I quite often uh, think about is just the the embracing of when there are scenes in our our historic neighborhoods. What I think is very important, too, I'm sure you're familiar with George Pelicanos. Working with George and going on set with George and to really witness a D.C. story unfold. I did a set visit with George over near Howard University. And just to witness the amount of students that was impacted, that particular project was D.C. Noir. And just to witness the Howard students that were there as PAs, to witness our local 
actors like, you know, Big G, Antoine Glover, to just see all of that unfold. And then the people that were doing the production and then the local culinary and transportation companies to be in that moment. And it was like reality. You don't have to go to L.A. You don't have to go to New York. You can stay right here in Washington, D.C. and have an amazing product, project, and you have all the resources you need uh, above the line and below the line and then some. And so that was a very special moment to just see from start to finish. We're, we're here. So it's not always around the focus of the national or the regional, but just to see that all unfold here locally really made a big difference. And it was impactful. And one of the things you talked about was the students and jobs of all, say, for example, the catering business. Mm -hmm. Can you give us an idea of how what jobs or how many jobs that brings each year? Any any type of figures you can point to? Figures are good because figures lead to facts. So I would say since the program has been reinstated, and once again, shout out to Tamir Bowser, we've had 56 projects. With the 56 projects, I'm happy to also say 25 of those projects were produced here locally. Now, what those 56 projects brought into our city, our lovely city, is 42.6 million dollars. Wow. That's a huge economic impact. 1,214 district resident job hires have occurred from those 56 projects. Just to talk about having a pathway to the middle class for our creatives, those projects resulted in $4.8 million in total compensation for our district residents. So that's how important it is to be able to maintain a film industry here. You can live here in D.C., work and play. You can be a creative here. But our goal is to make sure that we provide you the key resources that are needed. But at the end of the day, the jobs and the educational training that comes with that is what will carry a lifelong opportunity and really set a portfolio in place for our filmmakers. One of the things I wanted to ask you, if you could share any challenges that you had in any way that you overcame a challenge, was it a challenge with, say, like blocking off a street or was it a challenge to get, you know, a, a celebrity from one location to another location, anything like that? So what most people may consider a challenge or some people may consider an obstacle, I, I take that obstacle and make it into an opportunity. So that's really how I, I view things. Now, this is the nation's capital. <laughs> this is the seat of government for our country. And so we have to be mindful and respectful uh, of anything that comes into play with blocking streets. Or uh, there's always something going on in Washington, D.C. I mean, we just finished the big cherry blossom you know, festival. We just had Emancipation Day uh, in downtown Washington, D.C. There's never a dull moment here. And so what becomes the opportunity is to be able to communicate in advance. How do you get to the yes? And I always say there's a thousand roads that can get you to Texas. It's just about which one you choose that will work for everybody. And so I think what's important is that we don't over-prioritize one project over the other. And that has been the, the focus of opportunity that we really have to stay, stay true to. We cannot over-prioritize our project compared to what may be happening at the White House. Because at the end of the day, D.C., it, it, you can't replicate it. You know, yes, people go to sound stages and things of that nature, but here's the real thing. So let's see how we can work together to make it happen. And that's what it comes down to. I read recently Reese Witherspoon came to town and she was at the VP's residence and, you know, the mayor was there. And then this past weekend, we just had the Kennedy Center honors and all sorts of celebrities were in town then. So do you get to meet with these celebrities? Do you have a favorite celebrity or 
you're not telling anything. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. And, and, and if the mayor went there without me with Reese, then she and I'm going to have to <laughs> have to chat. Well, I, I could have mit- read the wrong thing. I'm right. just saying allegedly, reportedly, yeah, you know, no. <laughs> honestly, you know, it's, it's, it's a respectful, fine line with anything. Some things you do have to remain confidential sometimes with where a celebrity is going to be. But, you know, I take that word celebrity. And once again, I'm a little bit different than most, but I look at celebrities being the individuals that's here pumping into our economy. You know, I look at, you know, us as celebrities. I look at the t- my team. I look at your team. You know, Sandra, you're a celebrity. <laughs> I honestly feel that when individuals are in town, I make it a point to whenever there's an opportunity to sit and talk with whoever is gracing our city with their presence, because I always want to talk about not only what you're doing now, but what's next. So I make it a point to talk to who's in front of the camera, but also who's behind the camera. I love it. That That's a perfect, I think, note to, to end on. We're all celebrities in our own right in this great place. But no, thank you so much. To learn more, go to the Office of Tele- Cable Television, Film, Music, and Entertainment, and that's www.entertainment.dc.gov. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me today, and I look forward to talking to you again. Jack Gerbis is director of the Maryland Film Office. He joined the office in 1992 and was named to his current position in 2002. Under his stewardship, the Maryland Film Office has been involved in many notable and high-profile television shows and movies. The Wire, House of Cards, V, Runaway Bride, Ladder 49, and Wedding Crashers. He has had the opportunity to work with countless famous directors including John Waters, Jodie Foster, Tony Scott, Clint Eastwood, and David Fincher. Welcome, Jack, to Media and Monuments. Well, thank you very much, Sandra. It's it's a pleasure to be here. Why don't you tell our audience a little bit about you? Like, where did you grow up and where did you go to school? Sure. I grew up in the Hudson Valley in New York. Actually, uh, I went to college, a political science major. I was going to be a, if I was coming to the capital region, I guess I wanted to be a congressman or a senator from New York. That obviously didn't work out, but I always had a fascination with film. I mean, going back, gosh, when I was a junior high, I used to make film with my father's Bell & Hal 8mm camera. And I, so now doing what I do and being, you know, sort of on the creative side and helping out filmmakers like a Tony Scott or David Fitcher or John Waters, it's, it's, it's a childhood dream come true, actually. So how did you get from New York down to our nation's capital here? I was actually teaching up in New York and I moved down here now. It's close to 40 years ago and I was not in the industry then, but I began working for a small production company that would do industrials, marketing, regional commercials. Basically, I was a marketing and salesperson, but it was a way to get my foot in the door. That's what I tell young kids coming out of college. You're not going to graduate and have your ultimate job in the industry. You got to get your foot in the door, obviously. So I did that for a couple of years. I went to work for a bigger production company in Baltimore. And eventually I said, okay, well, if I'm going to get the client, I want to produce it. So I sort of was like on the ground to produce and circumstances just early 90s that there was an opening at the film office for a marketing person. I took it and I applied and I received the job. And then Homicide Life on the Street came in and the then location manager for the film office left to work on Homicide, which was this opening to actually work with designers and work with directors and be out there scouting the locations. And I raised my hand and said, I want to do it. And 30 years later, here I am. And the rest is history, as they say, right? (laughs) So to speak, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Well, since you've been there so long, how has your job changed since, you know, becoming the director in 2002? Yeah, well, obviously, when I became the director, sort of more pressure and more weight is on my shoulders, obviously, than when I was deputy director of the office or location manager. But the way I look at what I do or any film commissioner 
around the country is we sort of break up pre-incentives and post-incentives. Probably for the first half of my career, when we used to get a call from a producer, a studio executive, even a director in some cases, you know, do you have that type of location? Can you double for this place? I'm looking for a Victorian home on the waterfront. Do you have that? Then the second question, tell us about your crew base, which we're very, very fortunate in the capital region to have an extraordinary crew base. Tell me about the film infrastructure. We pay, fast forward to 2002, 2003, then the question started, tell us about your incentives. Now the first question out of anybody's mouth who calls that has, has an interest to shoot in Maryland, how many tax credits do you have left? And then we carry on the conversation from there. You know, if we have sufficient credits for that particular show, then we start going into our sales pitch, so to speak, about talking about the locations, how we can achieve what they want creatively, and then expand about a crew base and our infrastructure and why Maryland or the capital region would be a good place for, for them to shoot. So that's the dynamics basically is pre-incentives, post-incentives. So it sounds like then it used to be not as much about the tax incentives, yet that seems to be more the case these days. Oh, oh very much so. I mean, and again, the first probably dozen years or so of my career, most of the time I would be either out scouting by myself, shooting various locations, giving various options, or, you know, in a van with uh, a director, a production designer, a location manager who's in town to convince them that it'll work here. Now, most of my time is, you know, working with legislators, educating legislators about the incentive program. The majority of film offices are affiliated with some sort of governmental entity. So we're constantly, you know, justifying our existence or justifying the existence of our incentive programs and, and you know and that sort of thing so so it really has changed so that's so that's the biggest you know I, it was i probably had more leeway it was more fun when i wasn't the director because somebody else was answering those phones and those calls all i had to do was have my camera my script and uh, go out there and, and essentially you know we're, we're salesmen be it myself or any other film commissioner we're, we're you know, we're selling a product. The product is, you know, in this case, the state of Maryland. You know, why they should come here. Well, what is it about the state of Maryland? Because I know one of the things just recently, a few weeks ago, the film Wedding Crashers was on for the umpteenth time. And for the umpteenth right. time, of course, yeah, I'm watching it because it's Wedding Crashers and it's St. Michael's. And I have friends who have houses down there and I've been sure. down there. And so how much of that is is still a draw when people talk about, I'm um, thinking about doing a TV show or a film in Maryland? Yeah, I mean, a lot is because, again, you mentioned earlier, some of the, some of the productions that have shot here and some of them, you know, are the either big box office hits or critically acclaimed shows like The Wire, like House of Cards. But what you're talking about is sort of the phenomenon of film induced tourism. I mean, to this day, the in at Perry cabin is still getting calls from people because they saw the wedding and wedding crashers for about the first five years afterwards. Their inquiries increased, I believe it was about 30% of people who just wanted to have their wedding there because of wedding crashers. When a film comes into Maryland or Virginia or D.C., first and foremost, it creates jobs. Secondly, it provides revenue for businesses in the jurisdiction. It certainly puts a positive spotlight on the community where it films. And then also it's like a long lasting effect of this film induced tourism. People still go to the town of Berlin on the Eastern shore because that was where Runaway Bride filmed. That's where Tuck Everlasting film. Speaking of Runaway Bride, Baltimore County, Maryland, there is the Wa Chapel Church, which she ran away from that church twice during the show. <laughs> but you go to the Watch Chapel Church, uh, it's a cute little country church, and then they have the big sign outside where the marquee, where they change what the sermon is going to be every week. But down below it, in paint, it's come worship at the home of the runaway bride. So you're talking about, I mean, I don't think you can get more secular and more religion 
crashing than being the location of a movie. And they have people that come to church there because that's where Julia Roberts did not get married. Yes. So there, there is this phenomenon and, and, and there's been studies about it. And again, it, it's an additional bonus to having films shoot in, you know, your city, your county, your state. What's been actually some things that people don't know about your job that they would be surprised to learn? So, you know, there's the scouting, there's talking to the legislators. What is it that's something that people don't realize about your job that you spend time on? People in the industry, I think, appreciate what, for instance, I may do or Andy Edmonds in Virginia may do or Herb Niles and Angie in D.C. may do. But a lot of people think our job is basically hobnobbing with the talent, you know, yeah, having lunch I, I with that. Yeah. Yeah. Ha- having lunch with. Well, we've got we we the governor recently announced we have a, a Apple uh, limited series, Lady in the Lake. That began filming this week in Maryland, starring Natalie Portman and Lupita Nyong'o, you know. So already people are saying, oh, have you had dinner or lunch and met with Natalie Portman? No, I'll be lucky if I even see Natalie Portman. You know, we're we're way behind the scenes. You know, we're we're dealing with the location people, the producers. So, So that's a perception. People think that it's sort of very glamorous. I love my job. Don't get me wrong. And I have the opportunity to do just amazing things and and meet and some times become friends with amazing people that otherwise I'd only be reading about film comment or in people magazine, I guess. But, but we're, we're behind the scenes, you know, we're sort of making sure that they get here. And like any good salesperson, once you make the sale, you have to service it. You know, you have to make sure that they have a productive shoot and they get what they want, certainly within reason, but they get what they want. (laughs) Well, what is it that about this area, you know, and how is it that women in film and video help you when you're doing your pitching? Well, I, I, I must say that, you know, I will get probably six to a dozen calls a month from people perhaps new to the area or kids graduating with a degree in film or communication and they've got the degree and what do I do now? How do I get out there? And my first comment is always, you have to call the grand dame of Capital Region Film, Melissa Houghton. Right, and our you executive have to, director. Yep. Yes, the executive <laughs> director of Women Film and Video. You need to talk to Melissa. You need to go on their website. You need to join this organization because, one, you're going to learn who's who in regards to producers, production companies, you know, that sort of thing. And two, you're going to have a great networking opportunity. As we all know in this business, it, it's relationships. It, it's knowing who you know and who knows who. And, and it's just the way this industry works. You know, somebody may be looking for exactly you, but unless you get out there and market yourself, they're not going to find you in your basement. So you got to get out there. And then also the various seminars and various classes that WIF has to offer. I mean, that's the biggest mistake that anybody moving into the region would do is not becoming involved with women in film and video. It's a must. It certainly is a must in the capital region. Well, how has women in film and video helped you with your job? They support individual filmmakers, obviously and individual companies, but they also support the film offices in the region. They help us get the word out for things. You know, they give us the opportunity to meet with members, usually typically pre-COVID once a year, all the commissions would get together and we'd meet with the membership and educate them on what we do and how we can help them. Because our job is First and foremost, I'm at the Department of Commerce. So my job is create jobs and revenue for Maryland. To give you some indication on that, each season of House of Cards, economic impact was about $120 million. Over 2,100 Marylanders would, were hired as crew, actors, or extras. Wow, that's And funny. over 2,000 Maryland businesses supplied goods or services to the industry. So that's first and foremost. How, that's how we justify our existence. So that we call that importing production. Then our job is also to help the indigenous community, help the young filmmakers. And that's where WIF really becomes handy, where I can use them as a a tool to say, yes, you want to learn more about script writing? 
hey, there's this great thing that they have every fall, the script writing conference or script DC, I guess it's called. Go to that. So we want to work with, as a matter of fact, in Maryland, we have a small Maryland production tax credit. So for projects between $25,000 and $250,000, you can get a tax credit. So hopefully this will help nurture the next John Waters, Barry Levinson, those sort of filmmakers that have homegrown ties, but they need that extra financing to, to help complete their, their, their film. The other thing that I, that I certainly need to mention is our partnership with the Baltimore City Film Office. Most of the productions that shoot in Maryland tend to shoot in the Baltimore City area for a myriad of reasons. You know, if they're urban based, it makes sense. The film office has got a great reputation there and a lot of the crew bases there. So Debbie uh, Dorsey is the director of that office. And then about 15 years ago, we say that she came over to the dark side and became a film commissioner. She left production and came over and, you know, she makes shooting in Baltimore seamless and really, really easy. And Baltimore is a favorite place um, to shoot because of its urban appeal. Is there any other place mm -hmm. in the state of Maryland that you find a favorite place or some unknown hidden treasure that people may consider? We would love it for filming to take place in all corners of Maryland, you know, because then other parts of the state see the advantage of it and we'd get support from the region. I mean, Ocean City, we've had some success with some film shooting in Ocean City. Gosh, now it's probably about 10 years ago, we had a great little film called Ping Pong Summer that was written and directed by Michael Tully, who's a sweetheart in the independent world. And basically he grew up in Frederick, Maryland. And every year, like many Marylanders, they used to take two weeks off and go down to Ocean City for their family vacation. Oh, so yeah. This no, is that's, that's what our family did. Yeah. We'd rent yeah. a place and uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this, this is set in the eighties and it was great because essentially, and it played at a lot of European festivals. So basically it was like a hundred minute commercial for Ocean City that was screening all over the world. And it was great because it was in the eighties. You had everybody with the, the girls walking down the boardwalk, you know, with their Madonna wear on and the guys had their big boom boxes. And it's, it's, it's sort of like, um, you know, coming of age type of thing, but I had a great cast, Amy Sedaris, Susan Sarandon, you know, you know, and, and it was a, a, a delightful, you know, little film. We go out to Western Maryland and we had Gods and Generals, which was a big Civil War film, you know, that shot out there. Annapolis is another favorite area for filmmakers because of the, so because of the great right. luck, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, we like to call ourselves American Miniature, and actually National Geographic called us that, I think, back in the 30s or 40s, It's because we do have a variety of locations. You could be, you know, where the wire shot, and 20 minutes later, you could be where Julia Roberts was riding the horse, you know, through the fields. Well, one of the things you talked about was homegrown talent, and I was thinking of, there's Trevor and Tim White. Sure. They're the producers on, on Will Smith's movie, King Richard. And they're from Maryland. And I read that their mother had founded the Annapolis Film Festival, which just recently ran. How does that help young filmmakers? Oh, yeah. The Tim and Trevor White story is just amazing. And I would like to think maybe our office had a little something to do, just a little. But their first full length narrative feature was Jamesy Boy, which filmed in Maryland. This is going back to 2014. We are able to get some uh, incentives for them. And that was hurdle one to get them to come back home. Hurdle two was to get permission for them to film in the maximum security prison at Jessup, Maryland. It was vacant, but it was about to be torn down. So we were able to get them access. They filmed in there for close to a month. And I saw it right from them that these two brothers had something special about them, you know, and, and to see how they've grown. It's such a, such a great story about how, you know, if you really work hard and you really work it and you network and you just, you know, don't let any obstacle get in your way that you can make it because from there they did a couple other independent films. Then they produced the Rob Reiner film LBJ and then they produced The Post that Steven Spielberg directed. 
mm-hmm. and then King Richard. And it's just just an amazing story. And they're great guys. And um, we're one of the sponsors of the Annapolis Film Festival. So I know their mother, Patty. And it's just, yeah, it, it, it's just a wonderful story. We're so proud of them. I wanted to ask you about challenges. You know, is there a certain challenge that you, here's the different steps that you did in order to overcome those challenges for whether it was a production or a director, you know, in order to get that film made? We blew up a building and that was, that wasn't CGI or special effects. That was literally an explosion. That was about 150 yards from I-95. So we had to shut down I-95. We had a, a two minute window. Because you don't want people rushing down I-95 and see this big fireball, obviously, you know. So, and they had like 14 cameras going, helicopters, train. I mean, it was, it was just, everybody held their breath on that one to make sure everything was working because that was a one-take shot. Thank you, Jack, so much. This was really very interesting. I learned a lot, very entertaining. So again, thank you, Jack. To learn more about casting calls, crew opportunities, and filming permits, go to www.marylandfilm.org or you can also check out the Maryland Film Office Facebook page. Right, and that's when we, if there's casting calls or any information or any exciting things happening from WIF. And I want to thank you for inviting me, but also WIF and all its members for all the, all the work they do. You guys are a wonderful, fantastic asset to the filmmaking community you know, in the Capital Region, so thank you. Thank you for listening to Media and Monuments, a service of Women in Film and Video in Washington, D.C. Please remember to review, rate, and subscribe wherever you listen to this podcast. For more information about WIF, please visit our website at wif as in Frank, v as in Victor, dot org.